So like Bob was saying, we're going to be taking a look specifically at aerospace manufacturing and how our solutions with Stratasys 3D printers really lend themselves um, to that area in, in quite a few different ways here. So from space and satellite applications to aircraft, then we're not talking uh, flight critical components. You'll see exactly what I, I mean a little bit later on, but non-critical components like ductwork and covers, um, different things like that, that kind of lend themselves to the strength of additive without being uh, necessarily flight critical. Uh, we'll see a couple different applications there. Uh, industrial manufacturing is one of our biggest and most successful applications, and, and this applies for aerospace, obviously, but also across the board for manufacturing in terms of tooling and fixturing and things like that. Additive really, really lends its strengths there. And finally, um, in recent years, Stratasys has come out with some uh, new materials that can handle very corrosive high temperature environments that are find, found commonly in fluid oil and gas applications. So with some new material developments, we're able to expand our application ranges uh, on the Stratasys side of things. So we found three main areas where additive manufacturing really has a, a great impact for the aerospace industry. The first being lengthy assembly time. So we have shorter lead times. It's, it's a pretty hands-off process running a 3D printer. You, you pretty much press the, the go button and it runs. It's uh, basically like a, a CNC machine, but an additive process, uh, as well as some different design tweaks and considerations you can make while you're uh, designing your parts that lend themselves to reduce assembly time process as well through design complexity as well as ergonomics. Um, secondly, inventory cost. So now you have a machine that can very flexibly create a, a wide uh, number of parts and geometries. All you really need to do is keep that machine stocked. So it allows this concept of what we call digital inventory. So opposed to having a uh, hundred of a specific part on hand because either that's the minimum order quantity from the supplier or that's about the right amount before you, you run out on a monthly basis or, or what have you. Um, all you really need is the digital file of that part. And then if you need um, five of them tomorrow, you set off the printer tonight, let the printer run overnight, and you come into five finished parts tomorrow. So all you have is the raw material on hand, which then if you can expand that idea uh, across your entire inventory, you don't have a thousand different uh, parts that you need to keep on hand. You just have the raw material and then make parts as you need them. So be able to reduce that inventory cost by not having as much stuff sitting on the shelves. And finally, help reduce or improve uh, labor intensive processes. So this kind of goes in hand with the, the lengthy assembly time a little bit. But the idea here is that with additive, with kind of looking at some design tweaks, it's called uh, design for additive manufacturing or DFAM, uh, as you'll see it mentioned further on in the presentation. Um, we are able to uh, take these parts and, and use the strength and the flexibility of the additive system to either reduce part count, which just right away reduces labor, right? We're not handling as many parts, as well as consider things like ergonomics, um, uh, geometry that that is more ergonomic for the human assembler that may be not so optimized for traditional manufacturing methods where things like milling and, and uh, molding, we aren't really usually trying to do those organic kind of curvature surfaces that maybe fit to a hand better or, or are better for reaching around corners or something like that. With additive, because it's such a flexible process, those uh, uh, design tweaks don't take away from our process, don't add cost at all. So we can add those in basically scot-free. So there's a pretty large ecosystem of additive manufacturing technology out there. You can see on the left, a, a bunch of different technologies out there. Um, some we carry, some we don't as CATI. Um, today, we're gonna be talking specifically about one of our uh, OEMs, Stratasys, uh, who carries three different of these technologies. First being material jetting, followed by stereolithography, and finally, fused deposition modeling, which is the one that we're gonna be focusing on today. Fused deposition modeling, if you're familiar with 3D printing, you're, you're probably familiar with FDM, as we call it. It's a process of melting a traditional thermoplastic uh, in the form of a filament and kind of drawing out our lines via these CNC-controlled uh, nozzles and being able to build up our geometry layer by layer uh, like that. So the reason why this is popular within aerospace is a, a couple of reasons. One, we're using true thermoplastics. So a lot of other printing processes use different resins or powders or, or things that are looking to emulate, for example, let's say ABS as a thermoplastic. 
but they don't maybe get exactly the um, tensile strength right, or they don't exactly get the heat deflection temperature right. So they, they, they nail it in some areas and fail in others. By just using the, the base plastic of ABS that we can use in the FDM system, we are able to uh, avoid all those issues of kind of a lost in translation going from a traditional molding process to a 3D printing process by just using the exact resin that, that we used in the first place. So uh, that translation of the material properties over to this process is very beneficial for a lot of engineers. Um, FDM being able to deal with those true thermoplastics has a much wider range of higher performance materials. So FDM has, has some of the highest performance material in terms of chemical resistance, in terms of heat resistance, in terms of mechanical resistance across the board through um, additive manufacturing processes. So the those pop up, those three um, big hitters kind of pop up a lot with the aerospace industry. And by going with FDM, you're, you're kind of uh, uh, setting yourself up for success to be able to nail as many of those applications as possible. Um, we have machines that are flight certified or, or that are aerospace certified with the FDM. It's, it's one of the only uh, systems on the market that is aerospace certified as a 3D printing system. Uh, and finally, large build platforms and throughput capabilities. So especially when we're talking uh, manufacturing, it's, it's uh, short run manufacturing for sure. We're not talking millions of parts here, but when we're trying to pump out parts and, and reduce our cost per part, having a large build platform and large throughput capabilities definitely helps for sure. Uh, the three main application opportunities we see within aerospace are first off functional prototypes. So this is where we are. We, we've got a concept modeled up in our 3D modeling program, and we're just looking to get a prototype and try it out. And, and it's it's most likely not going to be our final process. We're going to use some sort of a uh, carbon fiber or fiberglass layup process or molding process or, or what have you. But we can lean on the speed and the flexibility of an additive process to kind of try it out first. And then once we um, go through a couple of iterations, really nail down what we want, go to our traditional process. So functional prototypes. Um, next is tooling and manufacturing aids. So this is where we're actually using the printed product as a tool out on the shop floor. So this is this is what it is. It's printed, we go out there, we use it. It's not a, a interim thing that we're testing things out. We are using that printed tool in our manufacturing process. And finally, flight componentry. So this is what I was talking about before where we actually are printing parts that go on aircraft today. They're non-flight critical, like I said, things like ductwork, shrouds, things like that. Um, but being able to get some of those parts, the benefit of additive, even though it's not 100% of the parts in the plane, we're still getting a really good bang for our buck by not having to make tooling for all these different previously molded parts. We're able to use the flexibility uh, of the 3D printing system. <clears throat> So here's that uh, DFAM, DFAM, or design for manufacturing or for additive manufacturing I was talking about before, and uh, kind of a look at where in the process does this kind of have the best bang for your buck. So if we're looking at the left at rapid prototyping, the goal of rapid prototyping is a rough draft, right? Our, our, we're going to go to a molding process, we're going to go to a milling process, and we're going to make a million of these things, but we don't want to have to pay for a mold and wait for a mold to be made, we want to be able to print it on the printer, test it out, and then decide that that's what we want for our mold. So designing this part for the 3D printing process doesn't really make too much sense. Um, you're only going to make, I mean, worst case, something like 10 or so prototypes, uh, whereas you're going to be molding a million of these. So where do we want to optimize our design for the process that's making 10 of these, the process that's making a million of these? We still want to keep our design optimization for that molding or that milling process. If there are things we can tweak that don't hurt the molding or milling process and help the printing process, by all means, knock yourself out. You're going to get a little bit better bang for your buck out of there. But in generally speaking, we're not really focused on design for, for additive manufacturing at the rapid prototyping stage. As we move along through tooling, manufacturing aids, and, and definitely for production parts, if we're doing a run of 1,000 production parts, uh, you better believe that I'm looking at every single um, trick in the book to be able to squeak out uh, a little bit faster cycle time or save a little bit of material on theirs because this is our final process. Our, our, we are going to print these parts through and through, so the more optimization we can do for additive, the more bang for our buck we're going to get here. So we're just showing that, that along the process of, of different applications, there are areas where kind of uh, designing for the 3D printer makes sense and areas where maybe it doesn't make so much sense. A 
couple of trends we've seen in aerospace and, and how additive really lends itself to these trends. So first off being lightweighting, obviously every pound you can save in terms of aircraft is, is definitely great when your goal is to fight gravity the entire time. Uh, assembly reduction for reduction in cost, labor costs and, and labor time lead times and feature integration. So this is a kind of unique one we'll talk about um, kind of going along the same idea of assembly reduction, but in, in a neat way. So with light weighting, um, you see all these parts I've got up on the screen here, all sorts of lattice structures, things like that. Um, you definitely could, at least some of these, go about a traditional milling or molding process, depending on the complexity. But the more that you try to save weight in the design for those traditional processes, the more you are paying for it on the front end in terms of uh, either tooling or, or cycle time with like a mill or something like that. So you are paying more to get a better performing part out. With these lightweighting processes, you're looking at like, let's just throw some numbers out. If you can get like a 50% weight reduction and still have like 90% of the um, strength of the part if it were a solid part. So generally speaking, especially for milling and molding, you're not gonna see this too often. It's, it's going to be more of a solid part where the outer shell is the shape of the design and, and it's just solid through and through. With the printing process, however, these lattice structures are obviously really great for our end result to save on uh, weight. But during the printing process, this, so this d increased design complexity, which definitely looks design uh, increased complexity and visual complexity, is actually better for the 3D printer. We're putting down less material, which means one, we're saving on material cost, and two, we're saving on processing time because we don't have as many uh, cubic inches of material to force through that nozzle and, and make those tool paths. So although it looks more complex on the front end, from a manufacturing and a production standpoint, it's actually better for the 3D printer. So now we've kind of got this, this two for one deal where we're getting a lighter part and we're getting it faster and cheaper by using a 3D printing process. So you can see how this really lends itself to aerospace manufacturing um, by having pretty much everything you could want for optimizing a part. Reduce cost, faster time, better performance. With assembly reduction, this is a, a, again along the terms of designing for the process you are using. So you can see on the bottom left there, that part is made out of a bunch of milled uh, flat stock, a little bit uh, funky stuff going on with the angle block up right, but mostly milled flat stock, right? And this was obviously made with a traditional machining process and it was designed for that process for uh, ease of um, machining for the operator as well as reduction in scrap right we don't want to be milling out huge chunks of metal it works good but you can see the assembly time and the increased design complexity by having all those different components and all the different bolts that need to be assembled together whereas you can see that same part in the the middle of the screen right above that was just printed all pretty much as one piece minus the nameplate at the top so because we are building from the ground up with an additive process as opposed to a subtractive process we can kind of just design exactly what we want and go with it from there. So it comes out basically assembled is the idea of this, this part right here. Comes out of the machine, assembled, ready to go, pretty much no hands-on time, uh, maybe a little bit support cleanup, things like that, but nothing compared to the one down below. So we're able to uh, utilize the fact that this is an additive process as opposed to a subtractive process to reduce our assembly time and labor. Finally, feature integration. This is one of my, my favorite things. Whenever I see an application that, that we can lean on for this, come across my desk, I, I always get excited. Um, this is where we are using the flexibility of the additive system to integrate a feature into the part. And what do I mean by that? Here's a couple examples. So in the top middle of your screen, those kind of upside down Y looking parts, those are vacuum grippers for a robotic arm. So that that um, piece would come to a sheet metal part that was bent at 90 degrees and, and vacuum it up and move it around the work cell. Traditionally, this was a machined part, um, several pieces, and had all sorts of vacuum tubing running down the arm, going to the port so that we could create a, a reliable vacuum suction so we can move the part. With the printing process, we actually were able to put those uh, vacuum tubes inside of the part. Again, something that would be very difficult to do with a subtractive process, but additive actually it's better because we're laying down less material, right? So you can put those vacuum channels inside the tool itself and not have to worry about one, sourcing extra parts for vacuum tubing and two, having kind of the loose tubing uh, uh, dangling around the part as it's working around the work cell and, and creating potential hazards there. 
So we integrated the feature of those vacuum tubes within the robotic gripper itself. The other one I'll highlight is on the top right. This is a molding insert. So we are injection molding with this. Um, with injection molding, you always want to pull as much heat out of the mold as quickly as possible for two reasons. Reduce your cycle time, which increases your throughput, as well as reduce your scrap rate. The more we can evenly pull heat out of that mold, the less chance we have of une uneven warping or unpredictable warping going on. Again, same concept as the vacuum tubes. We can uh, uh, put these cooling channels inside of this part during the printing process. And so we can have this really crazy corkscrew co cooling channel going on that through traditional methods would be impossible, but it's really optimized for pulling the heat out. And again, really no skin off the 3D printer's back. It enjoys it, it's laying down less material. So a bunch of cool different features like that going on where we can lean on the strengths and the flexibilities of that additive process to kind of get a little bit of extra uh, bang for our buck out of that. So let's look specifically at what kind of FDM solutions we have with Stratasys. So again, to, re to review, the reason why we're, we're looking at FDM and why FDM is so popular with uh, aerospace is the high throughput, low cost, material versatility, it's unattended, and no added cost for design change, right? We don't, we don't have to wait on tooling to be made. We don't have to pay for a new tool. All we have to do is a couple of clicks in our CAD program to change our file. Here's the entire lineup of FDM materials, or excuse me, FDM machines available through Stratasys. So from the F120 all the way up to the F900, we've got quite a few different machines available, and they vary in uh, build tray size, they vary in materials available, they vary in um, performance, they vary in cost, obviously. So there's a bunch of different factors that go into choosing the right machine for your application or applications. We've got the F900 circled in red here. This is the machine that is aerospace certified. So if you're trying to do something, you're trying to print and use parts that are going on an aircraft, you're gonna be going with the F900 system. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in the following slides. If we're doing things along the lines of prototyping or manufacturing aids, like we've been talking about, things that don't need to be aerospace certified, but are still useful for the aerospace industry, then you could use any other machine on this list, um, depending on materials and size and things like that. But it really opens up the door. You really only have to use the F900 if you're going for that uh, certified process. So talking more in depth on that F900, it's a F900 AICS or stands for Aircraft Interior Certified Solution. So this was designed specifically for the aerospace industry. There is an F900 machine that is non uh, interior certified solution uh, that, that they actually started with that and really ramped it up in terms of machine reliability and repeatability, as well as material traceability and um, repeatability on, on the resin side of things. So breaking this down into very, very simple high level, what does this mean? It's a specifically configured F900 Pro. It has consistent reliable material properties through the certified Ultum 9085 material. So it's this one machine and this one material uh, that, that are uh, certified through the aerospace process. It also comes with a toolkit for calibration. So normally if you're, if you're going with a, uh, um, an F-series printer, they don't come with or require these added calibration tools, but because of that certification process, this toolkit is required to make sure that your machine and your material are staying within that certification range. So the areas of opportunity with this machine, like I said, the non-flight critical components, where we can still uh, get a lot of benefit from the flexibility and the toolless operation of the 3D printer. So electrical housings, clips and clamps, environmental control system ducting, air filter boxes, all these things that are traditionally plastic molded pieces can now be printed. And the reason why this is good is because depending on the, the uh, run size or the inventory size that they need for these parts, they're generally not going uh, very high runs where it would make sense to get a metal mold because we're making a million or 10 million of these parts. They're not getting anywhere near that many planes that they're making a year. Maybe they're making a thousand or 10,000 or something like that. Um, and being able to print those out on demand as opposed to have a tool made, um, the whole process of prototyping and tweaking and iterations with a tool versus doing it with a 3D printer, as well as the digital inventory bonus that we talked about. Printers really lend themselves to this kind of an application. 
Here's a look at the different performance standards comparing the uh, first on the left. We're looking at the Ultim 9085 certified grade versus the previous uncertified grade. So you can see that the on the left, um, the uncertified grade was a little bit weaker in terms of tensile strength and had a lot more variability. Whereas once we went to the certified grade, it has more traceability, higher tensile strength, and a much tighter range of repeatability. So that's the kind of testing uh, results that was needed in order to get that aircraft certification. On the right, we see a mechanical repeatability testing by technology. So we're not just looking at FTM here, we're looking at multi-jet fusion, SLA, SLS, all these different uh, potential technologies for the aerospace industry. And what this is telling us is that not only is, the, is FDM one of the higher strength options, it's also one of the best repeatability options. So it, it really lends itself at the top of the pack of all these different technologies of what we really are looking for in aerospace applications. Here's two examples of, so of some flight certified components. So the Airbus parts on the left, this is a bracketing system. So again, something that they traditionally would have molded or maybe made out of uh, sheet metal and had to assemble a bunch of different parts here. Now they can be printed in vastly reduced number of parts and lean on that flexibility of the uh, uh, printing system. On the right, we've got an Ultum 9085 ducting application. So this is great because again, the flexibility and lack of assembly required here, this was a, a multi-part assembly before, can be printed in two or three pieces here. You can see the, the two different angles of the duct are printed in different uh, processes and then bonded together afterwards, as well as the flame smoke and toxicity for the uh, Ultum 9085 material as the uh, uh, material properties indicate. So how do we go about choosing what machine is best? We, we don't start there at all. The first thing we look at is the application. What are you trying to accomplish? And what are your application critical um, variables that, that we need to be able to perform to? So first we look at the application. From there, that defines what material characteristics we need. Do we need something that's rubber-like? Do we need something that has high strength, corrosion resistance, high temperature? Whatever is demanded from your application, that will help us figure out which technology we need to use. Once we've figured out the technology, we can start getting into the more mundane aspects like, okay, what kind of part size are you trying to make? How many parts are you trying to make at once? And those kind of questions will lend themselves to what machine we need to go with. So we start with the application, we work our way uh, towards what machine we're looking for. So you see on the right an example, if we're looking at high temperature thermal forming, obviously for our material characteristics, we need something that is high temperature resistant or else it's gonna fail right away. And uh, something with printable air channels would be nice. So we don't have to come back as a post-process to machine air channels. FDM lends itself to that. It's a naturally porous material. So the entire surface has a nice, even clean uh, vacuum pull all across it. And we have high temp materials. So fits really, really nicely. Based on the other um, nitty gritties of the application, we decide that the Fortis 450 is the right machine to go with. So let's take a look at a couple of specific materials from the Stratasys FDM material portfolio. We've got it kind of broken into standard plastics, engineering grade plastics, and high performance specialty. This is the Ultim 9085 we've been talking about. This is a PEI thermoplastic. It is the one that is aircraft certified. So it has excellent strength to weight ratio, heat resistance, and high impact strength. So it's a really good all around material where, um, which is the reason that they chose it for the aerospace certification. It's a very long, very expensive process to get materials certified for the aerospace industry. So they tried to find uh, one that would cover as many bases as possible because they didn't wanna or, or weren't able to certify all the materials of their portfolio all at once. Additionally, it is FAA certified for FST or flame smoke and toxicity rating. Next up, we have ABS ESD7. ABS, a traditional thermoplastic. If you're uh, familiar with thermoplastics, you're probably familiar with it. ESD stands for electrostatic dissipative. So this is great for sensitive electronic applications where uh, if you had the sort of static uh, electricity that would build up on a normal plastic part, would potentially damage your electronics. With this resin, that doesn't happen. The static is dissipated uh, very quickly and easily, allowing for safe handling and um, processing of sensitive electronic components. Next up, we have our Antero resin. This is a PEC-based resin, and it really lends itself to high temperature and 
high chemical resistance applications. It has pretty good high, pretty good strength. We have other materials that are stronger. We generally recommend this one for the chemical resistance and high temperature applications. Next, we have ST-130. This is, a, this is actually one of my favorite materials because it, it utilizes all the strengths of the additive process, but doesn't have an additive output at the end of it. You're not holding a 3D printed part in your hand. So what we're doing is this is for um, layup or, or wrap tools. So the first part you see on the left, that's the part that comes out of the printer. From there, we wrap it with carbon fiber. And then in order to get that material out, we soak it out with a, uh, a material removal solution. The printing is very, very accurate for all that complex curvature, something that would probably either need to be milled and uh, a lot of uh, operator time and expertise to get those tool paths right on for a milling machine or done by hand, which then is very uh, touchy in terms of quality. Additionally, like we are talking about the lattices for weight reduction, we can use those same lattice structures to allow fluid to flow freely through there. So we've got kind of a, a water channels already built through that part, which really allows us to soak that out super, super fast, as opposed to a solid brick of material that would take a lot longer to soak out, increase the surface area that we're attacking at once. So we're using this for complex layup tool applications. Nylon 12 carbon fiber. This is our, if, if we're looking at a very mechanically demanding application, this is the material I always look at first. It's extremely tough, has an extremely high stiffness to weight ratio. It's a nylon 12 base resin with carbon fiber chopped filament as reinforcement. So it's a composite material that we're able to 3D print. It's really, really great for any sort of uh, high stress, high um, loading application. It really holds its shape and, and is extremely, extremely stiff. We have another uh, Antero that came out recently. This is similar to the Antero we talked about before. It's a PEC-based composite, but it has ESD properties. So now if we need high temperature and high strength as opposed to the ABS ESD, we now have this Antero ESD option. Where can we use this on the manufacturing floor? All the different um, benefits and techniques that we've learned about so far through this presentation. I'm just gonna touch on a few very quickly. Um, we've talked about assembly, we've talked about R&D for prototyping, uh, fixturing for quality control, but also what I like to mention is the ability to use surrogate parts. So oftentimes we'll see that the QC lab or even assembly for practice runs or, or whoever needs the parts is waiting on the, the parts to come out of the uh, from their supplier in, before that they can do things like program their CMMs or make their, their uh, SOPs for their assembly instructions. If we can print those parts, even if they're metal parts, we're just looking for surrogate dummy parts, we can get those parts in hand and program our CMM and be ready to go before the real metal parts even get in the building. So we're cutting out all that dead waiting time of a couple of days of programming the CMM before the parts even get there. Uh, in terms of health and safety on the right, we usually see this in terms of the complexity of the part for ergonomics. So. Uh, more fitted things, uh, better curvature to, to reach around corners, reach under things, stuff like that, that would be more difficult and costly in a tr traditional machining method to make those parts. Again, additive doesn't care about that. In addition to that, we are, we're always printing plastic, we're printing thermoplastics, which are lighter than metal, right? A, a lot of the times we see these assembly guides and jigs and things made out of aluminum for weight savings. You switch over to plastics, as well as any plastics with that honeycomb lattice structure inside that we saw before, and we're gonna get even more significant weight savings. Here's a look at a mounting fixture. So you can see uh, how complex this part is, and every single feature on there, if we're going with a traditional milling process, adds cost and adds time and adds programming time to this part. This kind of complexity, as I've been saying, I'm a broken record here, the printer loves this. We've reduced the material we're laying down, we've reduced the number of tool paths we're laying down, so we save material and save time on this while uh, uh, getting the benefits from the different complexities of this and not having to pay more for it. Drill guides, so these are great for quick things like, like we saw that nylon 12 carbon fiber in the top right. Is this something that could be machined pretty easily? Yes. Um, it, it's nice to be able to drop it on the printer and not have to worry about it. Where I see this having a huge benefit is in the bottom right picture. Now we can make these drill guides that hug right up to complex surfaces. So this would be a multi-axis milling kind of process 
if we were trying to make this out of aluminum to get that curving surface and, and hug right up to it properly with our alignment kept intact with the drill guides. Doesn't matter for the printer. It's going to print out that complex geometry very easily and very quickly while keeping the accuracy that we need for the drill guide locations. Let's go through a couple of specific tooling applications here. So here's a nylon 12 carbon fiber tool that we used for a 500 uh, part run on about a millimeter and a half or 60 thousandths cold rolled steel. And you can see an example of the part that was finished on the right there. So it, it doesn't last for millions of cycles like a traditional metal tool, but oftentimes, and especially in the aerospace industry, we don't need a million parts. We only need 100 or 500 or something like that. And this is a, a, a great way to save a ton of time on the front end waiting for the tool, as well as a ton of cost. Same concepts apply with hydroform tooling. So if we're doing low run hydroform operations, 3D printing is, is really a great process to look at for making those tools. And you can see the time saved CNC machining versus FDM tooling. You're looking at uh, about a 60 to 70% savings FDM over traditional CNC in terms of time. Here's another forming operation. Um, this one was forming aluminum with 100 plus cycles. And here we're taking a better look at the cost and the time. So with the additive tooling, this, these blocks cost about $133. Traditional metal, metal tooling, three and a half thousand dollars. So we're saving about three thousand dollars generously, and we're saving about twenty days of lead time. So the money savings are nice. Um, oftentimes, I see customers get more excited about the lead time savings and be, being able to start on things faster and um, not have this be a bottleneck process. And that's going to wrap up our presentation.